All right. So we are we're we're going to do this week and next week also in John chapter 1. I started this last week where I went through the first 5 verses and talked about uh, Jesus being the, the logos, the God the word and uh, how we should think about that. This week we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13, so if you have a Bible and you want to follow along uh, or you want to take notes, that's we're going to be in those that those that section of scripture. What we're going to see is that in John, so in the Gospel of John, when we say gospel, it's just language that we use in Christian circles to talk about these four books at the beginning of the New Testament that describe the life and the works of Jesus. The fourth of those books is written by one of Jesus' followers named John. And in the book of John, the first, I think it's about 19 verses, are what we call the prologue. And John, in the prologue, is introducing all of his readers to the rest of what his book is going to communicate. And in this section, uh, he's going to communicate about the witness. The witness is a guy named John the Baptist. We'll talk more about him in just, just a little bit. Um, the thing that John the Baptist witness is a witness to is the light. And the word light is capitalized because in this passage, the light is called he, and the light is Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about that. And then at, at the end, and really the, the focus of this sermon, like when I write, what is this passage all about? It's, it's about being born again or having new birth. And, and we're going to talk about some of the language that God uses there and what's going on exactly in Christianity and what we mean by what it means to be a Christian and, and that sort of thing. So here's the text. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we're just going to go kind of verse by verse, and... I'm going to talk about what's going on here. So, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So, we're in the Gospel of John, and uh, this person, this witness, is named John. Two different guys. The Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John, who was a dearly beloved friend of Jesus. Jesus had an inner circle, three guys, Peter, James, and John. And, uh, and so, um, when Jesus went to do unique things, and he brought people along with him, if he only wanted to have a few, John was always one of them, so he had unique insight. Uh, but this is talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is uh, a guy that uh, doesn't mean that, when we say John the Baptist, doesn't mean that he was a Baptist like we think of, denominational Baptist. It means, it describes what he did as part of his witness. Uh, he was a guy who's, I believe, the only person that has Old Testament prophecy written about him besides Jesus. Okay? Uh, and so it's kind of unique in, in, in his role. He also was unique in that even when he was in his mother's womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit before Jesus came. And um, uh, inaugurated the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. So he, he's very unique. 
The scriptures say he, he dressed in camel's hair and ate locusts and honey. And he lived outside of the city in the wilderness. There are all kinds of amazing things about this person. Well, if you read uh, Matthew 3 and Luke 3, there's quotes uh, from the Old Testament uh, that, that they talk about the one who's calling out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the, path, the, way of the Lord. And so uh, you can find it in those passages. Um, but if you think about it, I mean, one of the things we, we think about when Jesus Christ, who is God come in the flesh, uh, God who created all things, puts on flesh and is born of a woman, you would think that there would be a thousand witnesses. you think that those witnesses would be in every major city and in every major port and in every major hub. But the way God designed it, he said, there's one that's going to come before me. And uh, we might think it's a guy who, or a girl who is very socially acceptable, right? They went to the right school, so everybody will respect what they have to say. They'll wear a socially acceptable dress and garb. Uh, they'll, you know, just to where the culture will embrace this one witness that God sends before he comes on the scene. And so in almost every way we could imagine, uh, John the Baptist, we wouldn't pick him. Uh, but God did. And so I think we can learn some things about that, about who we should listen to, about who qualifies to be sent from God and a witness for God. Basically everybody. Uh, as, long as, as long as you have the spirit of God. Um, we should be, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that if a John the Baptist came here and now, the majority of Christians would dismiss him because he's culturally unacceptable. He's dirty, eats weird stuff, so we wouldn't listen to him. And I think we should really check ourselves at this point uh, and, and think about, who, who do I listen to? Right? How much... Do my own prejudices play into um, who I listen to and why I listen to them? John the Baptist was unique. Um, he was sent from God. The, the main thing that we recognize with that is all of the work of God that is done uh, in this world is through people just like you and me who will say yes to what Jesus has called them to. And echo the message that he breathes into them. Um, but it is a man sent from God to the people. It can be a woman sent from God to the people. Um, very revelatory when we think about that. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Uh, the picture, uh, I'll get to the picture here in just a minute, but basically a witness is just someone like it's a, the formal language that they would use for somebody who takes the stand in a court of law. They're an official kind of sworn in. This is my testimony. I may witness to these things. Um, and in John, sent from God, uh, God wanted him to be a witness, and he's bearing witness about the light. Now, uh, there's two different kinds of light in the Gospel of John. The uh, one of the images that's carried through the Gospel of John in a unique way is contrasting light and being of God with darkness and being of Satan or sinfulness. And so when he when he's testifying about the light, he's not talking about uh, light that causes physical sight. He's talking about the light the things that are true about God and that give spiritual sight, both into who God is and to who we are. 
if we are seeing accurately, if the light is shining accurately, we will see God for who he is, and we will be revealed for who we are. Okay? Uh, and, and spiritual light or intellectual light is what we need in order to see and determine these things. And John is a witness sent from God to bear witness about that, and that all might believe through him. So his message isn't just a, uh, here's some good information. Uh, His witness brought every person who would come to hear him talk to a point where literally they're standing on a point and they have to lean one way or the other. I'm either going to believe this message or I'm going to reject this message. And and so um, John the Baptist did not shy away from, he didn't get to the end of his witness and say, it's okay if you're on the side. You can, you can leave and, and not make a decision. You know, he, he didn't do that. He brought people to that point and said, you have to make a choice. And the, and the reality is, whether you actually choose or not, you are still making a choice, right? And, and one of the things we can learn about this uh, for people who have become born-again Christians and follow Jesus, had their minds renewed, we're all called to be witnesses of the light in some respect. Well, I think we could take this image and put it over every ministry. Uh, whether you think about ministry as something that happens in the church or something that happens down at the uh, homeless shelter, or something, you know, whatever you think about ministry, all true ministry is a witness about God, and all true ministry should bring every person that they're ministered to, to a point where they have to decide, is this God? Am I being served by God here and now? Or am I being served by me? Is the God of the universe come to serve me? No lie that the God of the universe would do that. Right? And so all true witness, all true ministry, it always should bring people to the point of a decision where people might believe that God would do this. Okay? Believe is the goal. Believe is the hope of all witnessing, of all ministry, that the people around will believe that God is active in pursuit of them. He's active in this world. Um, He is not silent. Um, He did not create the world and then leave it, like an agnostic would say, like God is an absentee landlord. Not at all. He is is intricately uh, aware and involved in the details of this world and what's going on around us. And he sends people who are willing okay, to say yes. And John the Baptist said yes. And if you think about it, one of the things that is sort of a lie about ministry is people think, well, if I say yes to Jesus, then my life's not going to be no more fun. Right? Um, and and I, if we were to ask John the Baptist, okay, who, who was really kind of an odd guy, right? Lived in the wilderness, ate locusts and honey, dressed in camel's hair clothes, right? Um, if you were to ask John the Baptist at the end of his life, did it suck being sent from God? He would have been like, are you mad? Have you? No. No. It is absolutely incredible that I was sent from God. And and yet, here we are, and sometimes when God's calling us to do stuff, we're weighing out, oh, I really had other plans for that night. Uh, I wanted to, my favorite TV show, the Republican National Convention was on, right? Um, and, and, and so it's like, we're, we're, we're missing it, right? John the Baptist, would not have traded anything in the world for answering the call of God. Um, and, and neither should we. So one of the things I think about is picturing John. My wife, uh, I believe the Spirit of God's been uh, moving in her, and she's been leading our kids in devotions. 
and through the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the things she has them do is draw a picture of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, draw a picture of love, draw a picture of joy, of peace, you know, that sort of thing. And so I just, I think that, I think, I think there's power, something powerful is created when we, when we picture something. But if you picture John, he is a man, kind of socially unacceptable, but he speaks light that draws his listeners to a point of belief or rejection. And so you can kind of picture this, this person and, and whatever he has to say, it illuminates. It illuminates the people who are listening and it reveals who God is in his plan. But it does so in such a way that the hearers are brought to the point of, will I accept this or will I reject this? Right? And my hope is that here today, you're brought to that point. Amen. If I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, at the end of this, you will all be brought to that point. Okay? And I, my hope is that maybe a little bit every day, but especially when we gather together as a community to hear the word of God that we're brought to that. Um, and so and so that's something we should go towards. That's the witness, okay? And and I think for some of us, you came here today for that. I think some of you are like, um, I I I'm born again believer. I know who Jesus is, uh, but I have sort of filtered the call of God on my life, and I dictate what I say yes to, not Him dictating to me. And I would I would I would call you a nominal in response, even if even if you're in ministry. Anytime you're dictating to God what he can and can't do through you or what you are willing or not willing to do, that's, that's a, it's not, what, it's not what God wants for us. The next passage says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming in the world. Okay, so, I think I got some, yeah. True light. Uh, because the adjective true is on there, we have to kind of say, well, there must be a false light. Okay, uh, this, this means that uh, there are ways of thinking about myself and ways of thinking about God that are not true. Okay, and that, and that this is the true light uh, of, of God. The word for true, the definition goes like this. It says, that which has not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name. So you can call yourself the light, but if you are not actually the light, you're not the true light. Okay? And there's been many, many imposters, and there will be many more. Okay? There's only one true light. In every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name, real, true, or genuine. And if you flip the other side of it, it's the opposite of what is fictitious, the opposite of counterfeit, the opposite of imaginary, the opposite of simulated or pretended. It's not, uh, Jesus is the real deal. He is the true light. This light gives light to everyone. Okay, uh, In the context, it's Jewish book, Jesus is a Jew, and the Jews, one of their kind of besetting sins was, we're better than everybody else because we exist because God called us into existence. At the foundation of, of Israel, even current Israel, is that God called them into existence, and so they got caught up in thinking, we're special. They are special. But when you start thinking it, weird things happen. Uh, so when, when John says, hey, the true light is for everyone, in the context, he's letting Jews know this is universal that Jesus is coming for. It's indiscriminate. Okay, uh, It means that 
all who will hear um, can receive. It's not just a select few. It's everyone. So universal and indiscriminate is the language we should think about. Okay? Um, and then that he's coming into the world. So this world exists and until Jesus enters into the scene, this true light had not come. John was a witness that he's coming, but at the time of Christ, the true light had not shown in the earth. All right? So it's important to kind of catch that. And then he says, a he. So the light is a he at this point. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Interesting language that, that you think about one who, I, I think about like undercover boss, okay? In an undercover boss, anybody ever seen undercover boss? Kind of know what's going on there? Just as a caveat, if you watch the Saturday Night Live spoof on uh, the last Star Wars villain, what was his name, like, Kylo Ren or something like that. What was his name? Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. And Saturday Night Live did a spoof on undercover boss as Kylo Ren. It is hilarious if you're a fan. So, um, in, in undercover boss, right, there's this huge organization, and the owner uh, kind of, in a, in a little bit of disguise, inserts themselves into normal operations, and nobody knows that it's him or her. And, and I think that analogy probably falls short on many different levels, but that's sort of the picture of going on here. Except it's not a business, it's the entire world that was created through Jesus. Everything, the universe, stars, heaven, uh, every human being, all animals, uh, photosynthesis, everything was created through him and for him and by him. And he comes and joins that which he created. He becomes part of his creation. And the creation didn't even recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Okay, this is talking about Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. So in a general way, he created all things, and all things didn't know him when he came, but in a specific way. Just like I said, Israel has, uh, can only point to God for their existence. And, and so God comes to his own people, Israel, and he reveals himself as the Messiah, and they reject him. They're like, no, we will not accept you. Our maker, uh, the reason why we exist, we, we will not receive you. Um, and then he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And, and this is the language of salvation. But to all who did receive him and who believed in his name, he gave the right uh, to uh, become children of God. And I say this because I think we lose some of this. On, on one, there's just a lot of language out here about what it means to be Christian. Uh, a lot of people see America as a Christian nation. Uh, we, we think we're like, uh, almost like Christianity is an ethnicity. I'm ethnically a Christian, or I'm ethnically whatever your religion would be. And we have, to, we have to make sure we guard against people by default becoming Christians, because the Bible doesn't say that by default you become a Christian. Mm -hmm. It is by your choice, your decision, you look at Jesus, you hear about Jesus, your mind is regenerated to the point where you're brought to this place of, well, I believe, right? John's witness, so that everybody would believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And in this, John says it's something you receive and you believe 
and who he is. And that's, that's language that we should hold on to and should hold on to about receiving Jesus and believing in who he is. That is the point of salvation. That is a point when you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of the Father, that he died for our sins, that he was raised from the dead, believe in his name, receive, that he didn't just do that for himself, but that he did it for you. He did it for me. Okay. You must believe and receive. And then the, the thing that I really want to zoom in on is... Uh, sort of, he he gives people the right who believe and receive in him to have a different life. It says that they could be born not of the will of God. I mean, not of flesh and blood, but of the will of God. So not born of man, but born of God. Again, we should always, we gotta, we got to let the context determine our interpretation of this. And he's talking to Jewish people. And the whole Jewish bloodline thing. I'm a Jew of Jews, right? Uh, if my family has a name, I can trace back my genealogy all the way back to Abraham. I'm part of the tribe of Issachar. Whatever it is, they think in those terms. And the Messiah comes... And to all who receive him, they become born of God, not of man. Not of the will of man. That a husband pursued a wife or pursued a woman. And, and they had sexual relations and a baby was born. And he's like, no, this is an entirely different thing. All right? And to, uh, th there's, yeah, I don't know, that's a caveat that's probably confusing. So here's the thing. The word born has kind of stems from a root word, genos, or it would be genos in, uh, in Greek. But it's the, it's the language we, it's the foundation of the word that we get words like genealogy and genetics from, from, from genos, right? You can see that. It's all, we call that transliteration. Whenever a root word sounds like the word we use in language, in, in our language, transliterate, uh, we transliterate it. And then, but, but really, what I want us to think about and recognize in this is that almost every person, well, I mean, as, as a human species, who we're born to and the substance of sort of our genetics is what we think about when we look in the mirror. Uh, we allow, we adopt things like, uh, when I think about so the, the two sides of this, genealogy. Um, I think about the family name. On one side of my family is the Doliners, and on the other side of my family is the Youngs. And I think about myself in terms of what I've heard about the Doliners through the generations and what I've heard about the Youngs through the generations. Right? Um, there's some good, there's a lot of bad, honestly, that I've, that I've um, thought about. One of the things that uh, was always told me about my mom's dad uh, was about his temper. He was a small man, like... Was he five seven, five eight? Uh, would play football, and they were known for like knocking the teeth out of the people across from him. Imagine five foot seven guy having such a temper that he's coming after your teeth when the ball's hiked, right? And so that's what I think about, man. That's part of my genealogy, right? Um, you know, different different things. So the same is true for you guys. Right? I mean, this, a lot of this determines like, even like education. Right? If, if your parents uh, were educated and they have education as a high standard, then you adopted that. And you see yourself through that lens and you think about that as that's what we do. We go to school. 
uh, we get degrees. Uh, you think about this and like partying, right? We're partiers, man. That's how I've heard about the party thing. You know, one of the things about my grandfather's anger and then the things I heard about my dad and the guys that he ran with in high school was, you know, a lot of fighting. And not just like at the schoolyard, like, like stories about people getting their eyeballs gouged out. And gra- losing a fight and grabbing this part of his opponent and biting it out and spitting at him. Okay? So you, those kinds of things, like, it's kind of genealogy stuff. Right? That's, uh, that's part of my heritage. Okay? Um, but what is it for you? Right? What is it that was passed down to you? When you look in the mirror, how does your genealogy determine how you interpret what you see? How you think about yourself? Uh, genetics may be, may be a little bit different, but I think it's similar uh, when we think about disease, right? I was part of my genetics is you know, some people have uh, um, alcoholism. Some people have, uh, you know, diabetes. There's different things in your genetic code that determine your identity, how you think about yourself. Uh, I've heard that my two oldest sons, if you talk to them on the phone, they sound just like, their voice sounds just like my voice. They're like, is this Chris or Jared or Brian? Right? That's a genetic thing. Uh, now, the language that might be used uh, may, may be a little more of a genealogical thing, but the tone of voice, and it's like, we don't choose that. Right? That's part of our genetics. Uh, there's different things that we think about when it comes to what we're born to and how we live our lives. Here, here, here's the part that we get to is, we start recognizing that our sin nature and what I'll call our false self come from that. I, who I truly am is not determined by my gene code or my genealogy. Okay? Um, and what happens in Christianity, when the light comes, when you believe and receive Jesus, he gives you the right to not be born or to be of your genealogy or your genetic code. But rather, you get to be born of God. All right? And that is foundationally what it means to be a Christian, right? That my genealogy and my genetic code are not the final word on this guy or you, right? There's, uh, he gives the right to be born not of the will of man or the flesh, but to be born of God. And so this is the way I think about it. There's, there's a few different, I just want to talk around it. So, as those born of God, being born of God foundationally redefines both my genealogy and my genetics. Okay? I believe that all of us are specifically formed. Psalm 139 says, God wove you together in your mother's womb. That sounds like genetic language, Right? The weaving together, if you've ever seen gene code, it looks like it's woven, mm-hmm. right? That's the language of God, which as a caveat, uh, Francis Collins, who was sort of the head of the Human Genome Project, was an atheist. He starts mapping the human gene code and becomes a born-again Christian. It's like there's no way... This just happened. It looks too much like uh, it's been woven together. 
There's no room for error here or chance. Um, you might look him up. Francis Collins got a pretty neat story. But what, what, what happens is when we're born, because, I mean, here's the deal. When we look in the mirror, we see the person born of our genetics and our genealogy. That's just who we are. That's what we see in our, with our sight. Okay? And when we come to Christ and he uses language like, you are no longer born of that. You're born of God. He foundationally redefines your genealogy and your genetic code. You're of him now. Okay? And, and so he redefines those things. We recognize that the power of the flesh is overcome by the superior power of God to make us new and redefine our entire existence. Here's the deal. The reason why you make the choices you make, the reason why you spend money the way you spend it, the way you spend time the way you spend time, the reason why you're in the relationships you're in and live things out the way you live them out has everything to do with your genealogy and your genetics as from man. Okay? And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in Christianity, while we know, uh, while we know where we have come from has been a powerful force in shaping us, the spiritual reality that God is more powerful is, is, is evident. Okay? So whatever we see in the mirror and whatever we define ourselves by as from man, Jesus Christ, once we believe in him, he gives the right for us to be born new. And there is a superior power at work here. There is um, a power that says, although those things may be strongholds in your life, there is a stronger and more powerful force in God through the gospel of Jesus Christ to redefine you. So you can think about uh, your genealogy and your genetics through the lens of, uh, God, you caused me to be born of these people. Um, show me. Show me why. Help me to see your hand. Help me to redefine my a worldview so that the things I do, my actions and my life would reflect that I've been born of you and not of this world. Okay? Um, this is all made possible through Jesus Christ. This is everything we know about the cross of Jesus Christ. The atonement, redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, all these kinds of things, this whole transformation, this whole new birth, all depends upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's made possible through what he did on the cross and the resurrection. To those who received him, who believed in his name, he gives the right to be born of God, not of man. The gospel is the power of God to save all who believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, apart from Jesus Christ, all we have is our genetics and our genealogy. We will adopt some of what the culture has to say, but ultimately we even interpret the culture based upon, well, this is what my family's like. This is what I'm like. It's part of my genes. Right? And so we, we have to recognize that apart from Christ, that's what we're stuck with. And ultimately, in the sight of God, we need to be rescued from and saved from. Because the end of that path is destruction. Um, we see, we're getting a foretaste in this life of the ultimate destruction that's going to one day come. Right? We see death occur. We see uh, child rape occur. We see child prostitution occur. We All these awful kind, murder, rampant, abortion, right? The killing of unborn children. 
I read this thing the other day. 52 million babies been murdered since Roe versus Wade that have been documented in the United States. Okay? Death all around us. And that is only a foretaste of what's to come for those who will not receive and believe in Jesus. All right, in, in closing, uh, I just kind of, I want to ask the question. Uh, it's, sort, it's, the, it's the question where you think about yourself, the introspective question. Who do you see when you look in the mirror? When you th- and, and by the mirror, I can literally mean the mirror in front of you. But I also think about holding your actions up. Uh, lots of times what we say and what we do are differently. And sometimes our actions are a better mirror for introspection than our words. Okay. And so, but, but literally, it can be what you see in the mirror. What do you see? Do you see born of my mom and dad? Do you see born of the Browns? You know, the Nooses, uh, Jensen? Right? What do you see in the mirror? What do you see in your actions? Do your actions reflect back to you? that you're born of God or that you're born of man? Um, Jesus talked a lot about money. right? He actually said that where your money is, your heart's there also. Where does your money or your debt reflect back to you? Are you born of God or are you born of man? It's telling us. These things all tell us something about ourselves. And we would, we would be amiss to not look closely into those matters, but we would, we would be even further amiss to surrender to them. Right? They are only there for us to recognize, you know, I've got some work to do. It's Mary's in my life. And I believe, I believe and receive Jesus. And because of that, he has given me the right, but that is not the final word on me. By his power and by his spirit, I will be made new. I will reflect that I'm born of God, not of man. There's a superior power at work there. Uh, Are you defined by the flesh or are you defined by God? What's your genos? Okay. Um, For some of you, you've been regenerated enough and you know the truth enough, but you have not yet received and believed. You're still only born of man. And today needs to be the day of salvation for you. Where in your spirit, as we, even right now, as I'm talking, you can su- surrender to God and say, to the best of that I know right now, God, I, I believe in Jesus and I receive him as my Savior. I want to be born of you. More than anything in this moment, I want to be born of you. Um, for others of us, it's like I have, I know that I'm a believer. I'm in this process of transformation. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I see born of God. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I see born of man. And I'm, I, my, literally every day my life sort of hangs in this balance, this tension between these two forces. And today, God is calling you out of a particular stronghold that born of man has on your life. And today is the day where you say, God, by the power and the right you give me in Jesus, 
I claim that I'm, this is overcome. And I'll be born of God in this area of my life. No longer to sin or be defined by that. Uh, for others of us, uh, I just wrote, can I get a witness, right? Johnny B., can we get some people who are willing to, I mean, here's the deal. You're not going to look more foolish than he did, right? I'm, God's not calling him. I think he's calling you to camel's hair and locusts and honey. He may be. I'm not going to say he's not, okay? But here's the deal. The, the, the primary reason why people don't witness from a sincere heart is because they want to be accepted by the people around them, okay? And it's time to, like, take your foot out of that door, and put it on the line for Jesus at work, uh, in your hobbies, on vacation, at Walmart. Okay? Can I get a witness? Right? Um, and remember, um, I, I think, I think we'll, it's, a, it's something we set out to do, and we do it, and we kind of examine. Did, what, did it work? Didn't it work? Was I successful? Was God glorified? Was the person brought to the point where they were faced with the decision of will I believe in God or reject this person's witness? Remember that the witness brings people to that point. And, and so maybe that's what I think. I believe that every person born again becomes a witness. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row to become a witness for God. You just can say, hey, look, today at church, I, I became born again by the power of God because I believe and receive Jesus. That's a, that's a powerful witness. If that's you, let's go get you baptized. Okay? Let's make it a public witness. Invite all of your neighbors and family members. Biggest family reunion um, that you can think of, and we'll put you in the water. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to pray for us, and then we've got a couple songs. You just kind of go to the Lord in the Spirit and figure out where you're at today. What decisions do you need to make? Think about the person in the mirror. Think about the things that are defining you. Is it, is it the flesh of man, or is my, am, am I defined by God? Um. And um, take real and sincere hope with you into this, right? This isn't a graveyard. It's an empty tomb, right? It's, it's being called into life, called out of death. Uh, it can be scary, but you'll never regret saying yes to Jesus on any level. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Um, Father, I thank you that because of your plan, because of Christ and his finished work on the cross, because we have faith in him, we believe and we receive him, you give us the power to become your children, your true children, not born of the will of man, but born of you. God, I pray that that would become a reality for every single person here, that when we look in the mirror, we would no longer accept um, being defined by our genealogy or our genetics, but we're defined by you because we're born of you. We're the genos of God. Lord, I pray uh, if anybody here sees their sin and they fear what it looks like to live differently, that you would just carry them through this and deliver them from it. Um, Lord, even this week I have seen you delivering me of my sin.
delivering me from a false identity and it's scary but I trust Lord that on the other side of this you are going and that the results will glorify you and will be magnificent in my life I pray that the spirit would just breathe into all of us the confidence that the other side of this being defined by God is superior in every way, shape, or form to not being defined by God. Mm-hmm. Father, I pray that if there's anybody who is receiving you right now or has just received you, I just ask for your incredible hand of blessing on them, um, that you would help us to be good stewards of them and 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 uh, help them to become who you created them to be. Uh, Father, I pray that the journey would not shy away from being a bold witness. Um, In my own life, Lord, even this week, I've seen great opportunities, and I've seen your spirit be bold through me. And I want pray that you would open up doors of opportunities for us to witness out of a heart that loves people, out of a heart that is from you, that just desires real life for, for everybody. Father, in all these matters, we just submit ourselves to you and ask for your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen.